All of human history is a story of migration, people moving from one place to another. So American history is very much a story of migration too. Some migration is voluntary, like how the ancestors of modern humans spread around the world. In this series, we've learned how the Puritans and Pilgrims migrated to North America because they wanted to practice their own faith. But as we've also learned, some migration is forced. People may be taken captive, enslaved, or forced out of their homes because of events or decisions in which they had no say. African and indigenous communities experience this over and over again in American history. In this episode, we'll look at another group of travelers, those who migrated to the United States from Ireland and Germany in the 19th century, and not just the people who came, but how they were treated and why. I'm Dr. Danielle Bainbridge, and this is Study Hall U.S. History to 1865. Why would people choose to migrate? This is a question that's intrigued historians, politicians, economists, sociologists, geographers, and philosophers for thousands of years. Because why we choose to move says a lot about who we are and where we come from. We can divide the reasons people migrate into two categories, push factors and pull factors. A push factor is something that causes someone to leave wherever they currently live. Maybe they face poverty or persecution there, a natural disaster strikes, housing prices are too high, or there aren't many jobs available. In the perspective of the person moving, these factors are usually negatives. A pull factor is something that causes someone to go somewhere else. Maybe their new home would offer a higher chance at survival, more opportunities or liberties, or a community that would support them. In the perspective of the person moving, these factors are usually positives. For example, let's say Sarah grew up in Idaho and wants to be an astronaut. She might be pushed from her hometown because, well, there aren't as many space travel related jobs in Idaho as there are in other states. And she might also be pulled to Florida because of Cape Canaveral and NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Now, it might surprise people to learn that by moving between states, Sarah migrated across America. Internal migration like this is actually very common in most countries, especially as people move like Sarah did from spaces with fewer economic opportunities to places and spaces where there are more jobs available. Sarah was a migrant, but unless she took a sweet job in Australia to work at the Canberra Deep Space Station Network, Sarah was not an immigrant. That's because an immigrant is a person who makes a conscious choice to move to a new country, usually to live there permanently. So far, we've highlighted a few major groups of people in United States history. The indigenous Americans who lived here for thousands of years probably wouldn't be considered immigrants since they moved here before modern borders or countries or regions or states were a thing. Until the 1830s, there were two main groups of immigrants. English immigrants who chose to travel across the Atlantic and enslaved African people who were forcibly removed from their homes and brought to North America. Then, in the early 19th century, the U.S. had a lot of immigrants arriving from new places, mainly Germany and Ireland, but lots of other places too. In the 1830s, some 600,000 new immigrants arrived. In the 1840s, that number almost tripled to 1.7 million. Many German and Irish immigrants spoke a language other than English and were Catholic. As a reminder, Catholicism is a branch of Christianity that follows the authority of the Pope in Rome. Also, many of these immigrants settled in coastal cities like New York or Boston, and we could see their lasting impact even today. For example, Boston's professional basketball team is named the Celtics, and their mascot is a leprechaun. But despite these similarities, German and Irish immigrants have two distinct cultures. German immigrants usually had a wealthier economic background, were literate, and arrived in America because of a lot of pull factors. They were ready to get down to business and seize new opportunities. These relatively powerful economic backgrounds were a result of the push factors that forced them away from Germany. Throughout the 1830s and 40s, political revolutions swept Germany. There was a rift between the middle-class Germans who wanted greater protection of individual property and rights and the working-class Germans who wanted more radical political change. In the end, both groups were defeated by the conservative aristocracy, and many of the people who participated in the revolution fled to avoid persecution by the new government. The middle-class German immigrants often had the money and resources to purchase land in the American Midwest, which is why states like Wisconsin and Minnesota have such strong German ancestry. 
You can go eat a good sausage, listen to polka, or visit Berlin, or New Berlin. Yes, those are both Wisconsin towns. And the skilled, working-class German immigrants established breweries in cities like Cincinnati, Ohio, and St. Louis, Missouri. Today, Cincinnati even has an entire neighborhood named Over the Rhine, a reference to the famous German River. You can visit the Morleen Lager House there, which was founded back in 1853. Blending into the existing populations and climbing the social ladder was possible for these Germans who had land or business ownership. The adults could generally take better paying jobs, and they could afford to send their children to school rather than putting them to work. Many Irish immigrants, on the other hand, were pushed from Ireland and pulled to the United States because of one thing, famine. In the 1840s, a potato famine struck Ireland. Between 1845 and 1849, the blight took anywhere from half to all of the yearly potato crop, wrecking the economy and leading to an estimated one million deaths. This disaster was a pretty big push factor for Irish folks to head west to the United States rather than waiting around for something to change. The opportunities in America for work and basic necessities like food were a huge pull factor too. According to historian Brian Grattan, these Irish immigrants were more like refugees than free acting immigrants. They were poor and not very healthy because of the famine, often illiterate or very poorly educated, and didn't have the resources to travel further west or purchase land. Many Irish immigrants stayed in the port city where they arrived, like Boston and New York City, and they took whatever jobs they could get. The American Northeast was a major industrial hub, and Irish women went to work in factories weaving things like clothes and textiles while Irish men laid railroad tracks and dug canals. With all these setbacks, social advancement didn't come as easily for the Irish immigrants as it did for Germans. These social and class lines that were being drawn were just as clear at the time as they are to us now looking back as historians. And the English residents of the United States weren't always huge fans of their new neighbors. This sort of prejudice against immigrants from other immigrants sounds a little ridiculous. But a hundred years can feel like a huge difference, especially when you've gone through a revolutionary war and developed a new national identity. Many white Americans who enslaved Africans and displaced indigenous peoples felt like they owned the place and had cultivated the domain as God had intended. They considered themselves residents instead of immigrants, and to be fair, some of them were born and raised in the United States. Any new arrivals created tension, which was even more the case with the many, many arrivals of the 1830s and 1840s. Think of it this way. Imagine you're in a high school history class with 30 other students. You get to know your classmates. You get to know the teacher. Then halfway through the semester, there's a new arrival. If it's just one student, it might not be a big deal. But if there are 20 students from another class suddenly merging with yours, you might be worried about competition or splitting the teacher's attention. Things might get a little tense. Historians and sociologists have found that if there's a larger number of immigrants arriving somewhere relative to the number of residents, there's often more tension. And if their cultures don't have much in common, that can also increase tensions. But it's not just those two factors. We can certainly see nowadays how politicians, mass media, or anyone with influence can sway how residents feel about immigrants and heighten or reduce the tension, and it was true back then too. If we use this history class analogy, there would be a big difference if your teacher, as the person in power, welcomed those other students with open arms, or if they spread fear about how they drag down your grades or wreck the classroom. In the mid-19th century United States, we can see how these three factors contributed to tensions over Irish and German immigration. Earlier, we mentioned how hundreds of thousands of these Irish and German immigrants were Catholic. And as it turns out, there was a long tradition of certain Americans distrusting Catholics because they believed the Catholics were loyal to the Pope instead of their country. This was only amplified by the Second Great Awakening, a Protestant religious movement that swept the U.S. from 1795 to 1835. We talked about it more in a previous episode, but the point here was that religious leaders from various Protestant denominations believed that the United States was becoming less Christian, so they made efforts to reestablish or revitalize Protestant Christianity across the country. This idea that 1630s English immigrants saw themselves as native-born, as opposed to the new disruptive 1830s Irish and German immigrants, eventually led to an ideology called nativism. The goals of nativism were to protect the interests of so-called native-born citizens against those of immigrants. And by native-born, of course they meant white people, obviously not the native-born indigenous people that go back generations, 
or enslaved black people that have been in America just as long. An entire political party was organized around nativism. It started as the American Party and became the Know Nothing Party because they were originally a secret society. And when people would ask members of the society and later party, they were supposed to respond by saying, I know nothing. Very weird exclusive club vibes. The Know Nothings were no small deal, including over 100 members of Congress, eight governors, and even former President Millard Fillmore later in his career. They strongly opposed immigration in the United States and supported the deportation of impoverished immigrants, mandatory Bible reading in school, and a 21-year residency requirement period for immigrants and prohibition on Catholics holding office. Despite so many struggles and competing views, the U.S. is often talked about as a nation of immigrants, as President John F. Kennedy, a Catholic, once said. The United States became a country because of English immigrants who forced the movement of indigenous and African people. And we've seen plenty of immigrants like the Germans and Irish who weren't always welcomed with open arms. This kind of prejudice against certain groups of immigrants has to do with who they are, what they bring with them, when they arrive, and what people in power have to say. Now, just as much as in the 19th century, how we treat others, especially those pushed and pulled across the globe for any number of complicated reasons, says a lot about us. You always have a choice about how you personally treat others, and those choices are how we collectively make history. Thanks for watching Study Hall U.S. History to 1865, which is part of the Study Hall Project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.